Good morning and welcome to the 2021 edition of the Hashtag Co-Create Design Festival. My name is Africa Malane and it's going to be my joy and pleasure to be host not only today but for the next four days as we uh, really unpack some of the big, big topics and discussions um, pertinent to not only the people of Cape Town and South Africa, but I would argue pertinent to uh, people all around the world. Uh, what I'm looking forward to for the next four days is a wonderful, inspiring, engaging, fruitful, enlightening conversation around how design particularly can help address some of the challenges that we face on a daily basis, which have just been exploded exponentially by the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it is a Monday morning in Cape Town. It is slightly wet and gray outside. We are at the Biscuit Mill, wonderful setting here. Uh, that really is an expression of design, right? If you are lucky enough to live in Cape Town and have come to visit the Biscuit Mill, the kind of creative output that you see on a regular basis here is just extraordinary. So quite apt that we have uh, an intimate but very impactful um, collection of people who are joining us here today to come and uh, uncover, I suppose, and unpack some of the big issues as indicated. Um, we hope you'll be able to join us on this on the couch conversation until 12 o'clock uh, today. After which, uh, those who are joining us at the Biscuit Mill would be invited to lunch. And of course, some of them will get on a bus and go to Culture Cycles. And we'll tell you a little bit more about Culture Cycles. And don't you worry, if you are streaming from home and not lucky enough to be with us here, you'll be able to follow a live stream of uh, what they are being exposed to, what is being shown to them, and what they are witnessing. And we'll share the times of that a little bit later on today. And of course, the biggest part of the festival this year is the Resolve Challenge, the Design Innovation Challenge. And uh, this is a call for entry. And of course, in the afternoon, there'll be an opportunity for you to either participate virtually or in person in a facilitated workshop where we look at some of the ideas that have already been brought into this platform uh, and, and look for opportunities of how we can realize them for the future. And of course, there's a wonderful cash prize that comes with them as well. It's also an important day in South Africa because as we speak, the Constitutional Court is uh, pronouncing on its decision on whether or not the uh, candidates, both political and independent, are going to be allowed to continue with the registering or not. We'll find out, no doubt, within an hour whether that will happen. We're also still very much trying to get particularly men in South Africa to please go and get vaccinated. Uh, we know that the more of us who get vaccinated, uh, the sooner we can return to some level of normality. For as long as we're not vaccinated at the levels that we need to be, uh, countries in Europe will not be accepting us in the numbers that we'd like to and for them to come and visit South Africa as well. To give us a sense of what to expect over not only today, but the next four days, the conveners and the designers of this incredible uh, festival. Uh, firstly, Erica Alk, Group CEO for the Craft and Design Institute. It's lovely to have you here. And of course, Sebastian Merscherschmidt, uh, the Consul General uh, for the Consulate of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Let me start with you, uh, Sebastian. Uh, we started this journey six months ago when we had a series of creative dialogues where we were starting to look at some of the subject matter that we are going to unpack over the next four days. Um, why is this festival important to you? Yes, well, first of all, good morning and thank you for doing this again. Looking forward to uh, very inspiring days. Um, you know, what it's really about is not about just today and the creative exchanges we had, uh, which were online and also at the Desmond and Leia Tutu Foundation, uh, Legacy Foundation uh, building in the old granary. Um, but it's really a movie. And why is it a movie? Because we need to come to those solutions and ideas which are practically in implementable. And actually those creative exchanges that we did focused us to get to really good conversations today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, day after that. And that will bring us further to lay the uh, foundation to go to the resolve challenge, as you've said. And that's really where we want to end up with those ideation processes, the ideas, the practical policy ideas, the implementable business ideas, the, 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 the really agenda forward, things that creatively have come up 
by the people that are involved from so many different angles. And that's what design thinking is about. You don't just, you don't just sit in a policy room or an architectural room where you uh, draw up an idea by your splendid, isolated self. It's really about the process of coming together and getting all those people involved that have those creative ideas that are um, uh, also impacted by these, by these uh, issues uh, and come up with the solutions that really work for everybody. And that's, in the end, what we need to do. And that's important to you, Erica, as well, right? That these festivals and conversations should not just be talk shops, and rather we should come out of it with often very practical and feasible ideas that we can implement tomorrow. Um, absolutely. That's why we, I mean, we've, we've linked the, the Resolve Challenge to the, to the Co-Create Design Festival this year. Um, so the Resolve Challenge, people with, with ideas and, and all, you know, new, new business ideas, new, new solution ideas, um, it's, a, it's a process that we will be taking people through over eight months, a design thinking process where they really will grapple with the problem, which actually is the most important first starting point, if you're going to come up with, with a solution. Um, and so that's really what, the, what these four days have been about, and in fact the, the, the creative exchange leading up to it, is that we really need to understand the problem. We can't kind of skate over the, over the surface of issues and think that um, a solution that we're going to come up with is really going to address the, the root causes um, and, the, and the kind of systemic um, challenges. Um, and and so, so that's why it isn't just a talk shop, actually, but it's, but it's an important part of the process of coming to solution is, is understanding. And so we've, we've gathered um, an amazing array of speakers over the next four days, um, people who are experts in, in their fields or particular kind of area in their field to come and share their, their insights and knowledge with us. And then really for, for us as participants and, and the entrepreneurs and the innovators and the other ideas kind of people, it's like, well, how do we take that and, and take a next step? Um, I, want, I want to read something that I read this morning, if I can, that, that sort of struck me that, I, I mean, I read it this morning and it's so apt. It's from a, an article about why we need utopian thinking. Um, and I think that often we shy away from utopian thinking or idealism because somehow we think we'll be painted as naive. Um, and actually this article, which I can share the, the link to it, was talking about how important it is, and I want to just read a paragraph from it. Um, Changes in society seldom begin with actual interventions. They begin with acts of the imagination with a sharpened sense of a need for something new, be this for an engine, a piece of legislation, an idea of how people should marry, or a social movement. The details of change may eventually get worked out in laboratories, committee rooms, and parliaments, but the crystallization of the wish for change takes place at a prior stage in the imaginations of people who know how to envisage what doesn't yet exist. Oh, so, that's beautiful. That for me is what, we, is what we, we're trying to create the fertile ground over the next couple of days, is for, our, for us to think and, and embrace what's being, what's being said and then let our imaginations run, run wild. In fact, Sebastian, part of the challenge in allowing ourselves to imagine is that we are so busy trying to overcome a present challenge that is urgent right now, right? Yes. There's a need for water right this moment. There's a need for electricity right this moment. There's a need to educate a child, to give them nutrition, that we don't take a step back, exactly. ask ourselves what the problem actually is, allow ourselves, give ourselves the, 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 the space to be vulnerable in asking very difficult questions, and then imagining what the solution is before even designing what those interventions are going to be. Exactly, and this is also why we call ourselves Co-Create SANL. And that's why we like work, working with the Craft and Design Institute, because we need to sit, sit back and, and look at the whole picture and involve the people that, that really are impacted and, and have that conversation. And that's a, that's a step that's usually um, uh, overlooked quickly. Uh, people run into solutions and, 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 and run into policies but you need to step back and really, really uh, navigate the space first, look at the space, map it, uh, and find also uh, all aspects to it, not just the technical, but also the emotional, also the social, also the political. So it's, there's, there's so many angles to all of these issues that we're gonna talk about these four days, and we need to touch upon them, and we need to take the time to do that. 
Now, uh, a lot of the speakers are very much South African. Some of them, though, through your network, are Dutch, and they already have engaged with these issues and have practical solutions that will be easy, I suppose, to translate to a South African context. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most political answer well, you've ever it, given. It's, me, but it, but it's, it's a truthful one. It's a truthful one because it's not a copy-paste kind of thing. You can't, we appreciate that. But the, you, you, can't, you can't take a solution that works in one city and bring it to another city, even within one country. Yeah. So let alone between different cultures. Uh, we're 11 hours flying apart. Uh, so there is, there is, all these challenges have their own specific angles. And that's why we need that interaction. And you need the outside partners who are not in Cape Town, who are not in Johannesburg, who are not in Port Elizabeth. You need those outsiders to tell you, listen, this is how we did it, and get with fresh ideas to th get yourself thinking out of your own box, out of your own tunnel. But, but, but outsiders cannot bring their solutions in and make it just Not at all. Like the, the advantage they have, one, if they've thought about that solution already, let's see how we can contextualize True. it for a South African setting. Yeah. Two, by being once removed from the problem, you actually have a lot more of an unbiased, sort of lacking in baggage kind of viewpoint to what can actually be a simple solution sometimes to a real problem. Yes. And at the same time, you don't want to be driven by the solutions that are already out there uh, and want to be able also to be flexible and creative enough to come up with new things, mainly by combining those solutions that are out there with something new that you're thinking of in these days. So that's also a call to my Dutch partners to not only talk, but also listen, um, to, inter to have that real interaction. Um, it's not about bringing the solution. It's not about uh, finding the solution somewhere out there. It's that interaction and the, the meeting of minds that will create new things. And that's really what we're hoping to achieve. And it will be achieved, no doubt. Erica, at a high level, how are we distilling the six months of conversations uh, to the four days of the festival? <laughs> um, remembering to put this on. Um, so today we're looking at, at the economy, how we build a, an inclusive and resilient economy. And I think a lot of the focus is going to be on actually small businesses um, and how we really support small businesses from the ground up. Um, so that was the challenge that we put to, to the speakers for today. Um, tomorrow we're on, we're on healthcare, and again, how do we build a, a resilient and accessible quality um, healthcare system in the country? Food security comes on, on, on Wednesday, and we're looking at um, where, they are, where the system is broken um, for the majority of South Africans in, um, in this country, and again, looking at, at the problem, where might there be um, solutions? Um, and Thursday, we focus on water and sanitation. Um, very interesting. I mean, all of the topics, we're going to be delving into a little bit of granular detail, which is, I think, also where the kind of sparks of inspiration are going to emerge. It really is going to be a fascinating and amazing program, no doubt, over the next four days. Uh, this morning, we're starting with a wonderful, wonderful series of speakers. Usong Obavuba is the co-founder and managing director of SMME Implementation Consultancy Perpetuate, and she'll be answering the question of what we should be investing in as far as skills uh, are concerned, um, and where are the opportunities for uh, job creation in South Africa right now. Jenny Cargill is uh, the CEO of Strategy Execution uh, Advisors, which advises large organizations that operate in complicated environments. And she'll be asking the important question of how the public sector uh, can and should be involved um, in this space. Uh, we'll also hear from um, a gentleman who's been with the Jobs Fund for uh, numerous years now. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Fidelis uh, Hove, um, who's a team leader in the project management office of the South African National Treasury. They looking after a 9 billion rand jobs fund, uh, which is um, a challenge fund and uses public money to co-finance projects with the public, private, and non-governmental organizations. And they will be focusing on SMMEs. But to start us all off this morning and this festival is Dr. Abba Omar, 
who is part of the Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflection. Uh, he's the director of operations, a position that he has returned to. Um, between the two stints in the organization, he was the head of strategy and communication at the Banking Association of South Africa. He's the chair of the board of South African National AIDS Council. He also serves on the board of Business Arts South Africa, and he is part of the editorial board of South Africa's Journal of Political Risk and is a Business Day columnist. And the question that uh, Dr. Omar will be answering today is uh, where do the new opportunities exist in a South African context and market? Uh, where do we need to focus in order for us to have a bright future in this uh, country? Dr. Omar, it's lovely to have you joining us uh, this morning, and I certainly cannot wait to hear your insights. Good morning. Morning. Thank you very much for having me, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, not being a creative person myself, <laughs> I'm always glad to be able to shine and let the shine, uh, to be sharing that stardust with other people that are more creative than I am. Uh, so all protocols observed, um, I really am looking forward to this engagement. Um, I think in a sense, you know, the, uh, I've tried to look at uh, what would be the kind of theme that I should have for this um, presentation, because you've got the theme uh, for, from yourselves on access to a resilient economy, a focus on our future. And I thought I should speak on mushrooms and green shoots. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that intrigues you enough on that. <laughs> but I also want to reflect on what Erica was saying about, um, you know, just being able to look forward. And you know, I, I thought, oh, well, that fits in well with my opening slide. And this is a favorite line from a favorite poet. Um, don't mind the sexist language here. It was in the 1800s. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for. Um, and I think that's so important when you're looking at questions of design uh, that is meant to overcome the challenges uh, that we're facing today. And some of these challenges are dire. You know, the bad news is incredibly huge. Uh, we all know it. Um, you know, the past few... Uh, decade or two, you know, we've been struggling, uh, coming out of the great financial crisis of 7, 2007, 2008. Um, then, you know, sometimes people say, I shouldn't call it the wasted decade, but I think uh, under Zuma's leadership, we saw that, and now COVID-19. Um, our average growth, 2003, was about 4.5%, and it just went down during that wasted decade. Public expenditure has grown, and that's non-interest uh, public expenditure uh, to about 29%. But has that been effective or not? Last year, the economy contracted by 7%. Today, our GDP is about the size it was in 2017, which is just such a big challenge in itself. As we know, so many different sectors, uh, at least of all, you know, the creative industries have been impacted hugely. Tourism. We've spoken about rising levels of hunger. I hope people are watching the NITSCRAM surveys, which indicate how terrible uh, just hunger is, you know, apart from the poverty that we know that exists, and especially the increase in uh, cases of child hunger, where people, children are going to bed without having had a meal for a day or two. So these are real dire statistics. Um, as we know, you know, pre uh, uh, pre-2019, the creative economy was, con it was a major contributor to GDP, about 3%, uh, and quite transformed in the kind of South African statistics and so forth. Today, you know, the, throughout the country, um, uh, unemployment has increased to about 12 million, if you look at the wider definition. In 2008, about 5.5 million people were unemployed. Uh, they say it's highest in the world amongst a lot of the countries that do keep such records. And youth employment, which is really the most worrying, is about 75 percent. So, you know, I think it's all familiar bad news for us. Um, um, and, you know, there's obviously a debate going on, you know, where are the green shoes? Are we going to see, see the green shoes or not? So our friend from Euromix, Claude, Claude Bizek, I'm not good at pronouncing his surname, uh, said, well, mushrooms grow on dead bodies. Is that a green shoot? Yeah, it is, but there's a dead body below those mushrooms. And basically, he's raising the question that, you know, having all these dire statistics about our economy, and if you're actually seeing something's improving, is that a green shoot, or is it just the mushroom, a fungus 
that is living off the carcass of this body that we have. And that's what I'm hoping we can do. So, as you know, bad news travels fast. <laughs> Good news, unfortunately, takes the scenic route. And, you know, by the time you know it, you know, you kind of like have missed the good news. So I think it's important that whilst looking at the dire, the, the really pessimistic outlook, keep, an, keep a decently optimistic outlook. Uh, and one of that is uh, the economists of all people are beginning to get a bit more you know, excited. <laughs> There's some excitement in those bodies there. <laughs> and uh, they're saying, look, you know, we may end the year coming from a low base. We may end the year with about 4.5 to 5 percent growth. Um, and that in, over the medium term, it's over five to 10 years, we can see a 2.3 percent growth. Um, and you know, kind of given all the dire news, obviously people are naturally skeptical of economists generally, but when they do get optimistic, you wonder, wow, what are these, uh, like to have what they smoking up there. Um, and part of the reason is that, you know, you've got the commodities news, there is a uh, general improvement uh, on prices on the commodities and that's really lifting up our economy. Um, we, our exports have improved. So, we had one of the largest um, uh, current account surplus uh, that was announced the previous quarter in years. Uh, so that's already an improvement. But a lot of both of these talk to a robust global recovery. You know, COVID-19 2020 saw a slowdown, a huge slowdown, and now we begin to see demands improving. Now, part of it is um, and this is indicated by the, um, the South African uh, PMI index, the uh, Purchasing Manager Index, recovering strongly because, uh, you know, there were depleted inventories during the COVID period, the last year's COVID period, during the lockdowns, etc. And firms are being to raise production, both in South Africa and globally, and uh, especially on the African continent as well. Um, the other reason, uh, and this is obviously have been contributing to the ve revenue improving by about 11.2 percent. Now, part of the reason for the revenue improving is that it's true. We've had about 1.5 million jobs lost during this COVID period. But at the same time, uh, there's been a degree of stability around the middle income and upper income earners. So the personal income tax, the PIT, as they would refer to it, has been improving because of that. So, but unfortunately, as we know, that there's far too few people actually working. And that dead body that the cloud refers to is the dead body of this loss of a middle class, which is supposed to be the entrepreneurs, you know, the kind of people that would be in your audience, who should be there helping raise productivity, helping create goods, find solutions, etc. So, I think that's an important point to keep in mind that the middle class is reasonably intact but reduced and uh, improving their contribution to uh, to personal income tax. There's also the issues of morality that you know with the shift in uh, government, there's less of a tax boycott. People are more willing to be compliant, and already SARS is beginning to show the effect of that. Then there's really important government-led initiatives. Now, you've got Operation Volintlela. I think everyone know Operation Vula. That was part of our anti-apartheid struggle. And I think everyone likes Volintlela, not just because of Brenda Fossey's song as well. But there's a sense that, you know, when you begin to talk about exciting things, we want to use that term. But it is an exciting thing. It's an attempt to try and join up government again. You know, during the past 10, you know, past 12 years, um, there's a tendency for fiefdoms to emerge, DTI not talking to Treasury, not talking to um, employment and labor, et cetera, et cetera. So beginning to bring things together, beginning to reduce the cost of government business by you know, making sure that uh, we reduce the duplication, et cetera. Hand in hand with that is the, you know, the much promised infrastructure program, and it is coming together. You know, it, it's really coming together in many ways. Um, just this morning, I was listening to Dr. Ramakopa, who works in the presidency, who heads up the infrastructure South Africa, and there's a number of things that are coming together. Now, those, just those two are going to have a huge effect on the one thing that stimulates economic recovery most, and that's confidence. Uh, you know, investors have been complaining about lack of policy, certainty, 
uh, red tapes and expenditure just around bureaucracy, etc. Those are helping. I think another big factor that's going to help is the introduction of the IPPs, independent, independent power producers. The, the allowing companies to produce 100 megawatts for their own use and being able to sell it on is going to help in so many ways for the SMME sector that is so exposed to every time ESCOM supply goes down, it affects hugely production, etc. I've seen several studies that have shown that cons constancy of supply is a big issue for SMMEs. It's not just an issue for mining or big manufacturers, etc. The small medium enterprise is hugely exposed because often they, they don't have the kind of generators that kick in um, that you know your big firm would have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then to complete the kind of process that we're hoping government would uh, fast track and improve is spectrum auctioning um, that would hopefully bring down the cost of uh, data, which is the the thing that we probably the second most important that we want to see uh, in the SME sector. And then for tourism, having the visa re reforms that have been much promised being uh, continued. Um, I'm not going to go into this busy slide because <laughs> I promised the organizer I'm going to try and cut my text and slides as much as possible. But this is, uh, and I'll be sharing obviously the, this particular uh, presentation, but it's an important one. Uh, last year, you may recall Africa, the kind of debates we had that led up to President Ramaphosa unveiling the Economic Recovery and Reconstruction Plan. And this was, I think, at the heart of the Business for South Africa kind of input. You know, they're saying, exactly. how, sorry, how, how do we improve innovation and entrepreneurship? And, you know, one was increased startup skills. And I think there, there's this debate, ongoing debate about education versus uh, environment versus, you know, are you a born businessman or not? I think st more and more studies are showing you can learn to do, uh, you can learn to become a businessman. I probably never would, notwithstanding what people may think I have an ethnic advantage <laughs> and my grandfather was a business, etc. I'm just useless at it. But you can learn it, you can start it, but the state and, business and big business needs to make it a lot easier. We need to have non-traditional financial mechanisms. Having served in the banking system for four years, and you know as well, Africa, how conservative the banks are on this thing. And we need to find put the pressure on them, but also bring in other ways of bringing in money. And then the four IR, much vaunted, how can that be used as an enabler for SMMEs improving? Not only their operations, but also improving their offerings, of looking at what else they can do, what other business they can do. It was interesting that FinFind, in one of its studies, when they asked the um, small medium enterprise, what are the lessons from this period? And you know, they said, OK, we worried about uh, supply of uh, energy um, and the impact of OIR. But they said the one really important lesson is that not to be dependent on one revenue source. And this, I think, technology allows you to look at other revenue sources. Last slide, um, you know, Maybe during this period, if it's worthwhile, looking at some of the challenges that I've outlined uh, in the next two days of conversation, but we cannot get away from the legacies of apartheid and then those that wasted decade that has placed on us. And I think most importantly, at the social level, the issue of social cohesion, the events of July, you know, when we keep saying, oh, we can't afford to put in more money there, etc. Those rioters just sent us a 50 billion rand bill and someone has to pay for it. Government has to find that money to pay for it. Insurance, losses, etc. And then the high indebtedness of individuals, you know, we it, it's terrible where we're seeing with, because unemployment, the low level of salaries people are earning, um, you know, the studies again are showing that our income level at the lowest decile has never has not really improved compared to even 1993 figures in in real terms so we've got a huge challenge and that's why we can understand why there's high levels of consumer indebtedness and then we need to take into account climate change what are the impact it's going to have in the ways we do work the ways we produce even like what kind of natural resources we can access you know the western cape may have to live up to the fact that it uh, wine production may be going down and it may actually be produced more and more in KwaZulu Natal, which I'm really glad for <laughs> with where I come from. The green energy transition, what are the opportunities that come through that? Um, and then most importantly is developing, and, and I think 
as SMMEs, as creators, you can put pressure on policy makers as well. Because when we achieved our liberation in 1994, you know, we had a political settlement par excellence, a wonderful constitution in 1996. But there hasn't been a clear economic policy for prosperity. We've had Gear and we had Askisa going the opposite direction and Ibrahim Protev's, you know, NSG, etc., etc. And they're all clashing with each other. We need to put pressure on our public representatives to say, look, guys, we need one policy that you know you can try out, take it forward, etc. And for me, at the core of that would be growth, and especially growth through improving productivity. And that means addressing the skills crisis, stemming the loss of people going overseas, but also working out which people you want to bring in. As someone was saying, our president goes around the world wanting capital to come in from foreign sources. Why don't we allow labor to also come in from foreign sources? Get labor that we need in, in, in our economy. And then addressing the loss of the middle class that I spoke to, the dead body. Finally, the state can play a role in economic development, but at the core of the policy of economic prosperity must be the shift from the household, you know, trying, it's really important to keep the social net going, but equally we need to emphasize improving the firms, improving the small medium enterprises, make sure that, you know, the, the ministry for small business is not seen as some little backwater that you dump somebody because their political marbles are being lost. Thank you. Really appreciate having shared some thoughts. I hope that will be useful for the rest of us. Dr. Omar, thank you very much for that. And there's an applause for you. Um, in part, I think, because really, you're just a tonic, right? You, you're able to remind us in, in a short space of time that, as you say, there is good happening in South Africa because we don't, we don't promote it enough, we don't talk about it as much. But you didn't answer your own question. Is this a mushroom growing on a dead carcass, or is it a green shoot? You know, I would be, I would be like philosophers and say, I leave that to you to answer. <laughs> but I think being the optimist that I am, and that's why I deliberately wore green today, is to say that, you know, um, I think we're seeing green shoots. Um, we, we're seeing quite a... Uh, let me start one step back, that... Over the past couple of weeks, being at the Mapungubwe Institute, you know, uh, you get exposed to a lot of different dialogues, whether it's on the fiscal space, the monetary policy space, and you saw with Lesisha Kanyako's kind of debate about where should the inflation targeting happen, et cetera. And then I think the kind of uh, emphasis government is placing, for example, on uh, redressing the loss on the tourism numbers, et cetera. Um, and then the whole debate around localization, um, and uh, helping SMMEs in South Africa. So I think there's, again, uh, a coalescing of different initiatives and forces coming together. Uh, so I'm quite optimistic. So my color is green. <laughs> I hear that. The, 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 the challenge often, though, is, I suppose, that important philosophical discussion of how much involvement should there be from government generally. Uh, we know that we have a governing party in the national government uh, that is itself divided as to what the economic policy should be, which is why we've seen the chopping and changing. Uh, many economists will argue that they are literally just simple but painful changes that need to be made to the economic policy that will then unlock a lot of the opportunity which will release uh, the jobs. But if you are in partnership with a communist party, uh, with a trade union, um, your ability to maneuver freely, I suppose, in determining economic space and policy is a lot more difficult, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. Um, and given my background in government, uh, etc., you know, uh, I still believe a lot good can be achieved by getting the right people and the right policies in place. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, I've been citing uh, Ricardo Hausmann, the uh, um, Venezuelan uh, economist. And he was saying that, you know, in a situation where you have a crisis and the state is not able to provide the leadership out of the crisis, it becomes incumbent on the other role players. And, and so while I was at Barca, one of the things that we really, really emphasized that business needs to come to the party, you know, the, and, you know, we've had fantastic, fantastic examples of that when uh, you had a big business 
putting emphasis on uh, PW Bota, for example, and saying, look, we've got to liberalize the economy, we have to change the economic set and the political setup, etc. You've had different moments where if you had the Mbeki era, uh, you know, you had different working groups um, who would have access to the policymakers, etc. So you've got some kind of involvement, but I think that business itself needs to play a bigger role. Um, they, you know, they, they tend to be a little bit caught out um, because they're so, you know, caught up in all kinds of arrangements with government and state and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, 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 it, there's so many examples. Even when I speak to some of the really old trade unions, I, I love speaking to old people because there's so much of wisdom there. And they're saying that, you know, it is so much easier for them to sit down over a beer or a glass of wine, or whatever, and have a chat with captains of industry even so that they could say, look, our membership are going to insist on this and you guys really need to give in on that, etc. So even those kind of dialogues don't happen as frankly and as openly as we need, need to do. So, I mean, the government needs to get its act together, no doubt about it. You know, we all know that there's the, the government tends to montage issues <laughs> as we go along and that kind of thing. but. Business can play a bigger role, and not just big business, also organized SMME sectors, etc., need to have a voice, that need to create their own voices and put the pressure on it. So I would say that, yes, you know, there, there's been movements and uh, movement to the left and a movement to the right, and sometimes never moving forward, but you, you need to keep pushing that. We certainly do. Dr. Omar, thank you very much. As I said, your insights were most valuable. Um, you'll stay with us, of course, until 12 noon today. Mm -hmm. And if uh, you uh, have any questions for Dr. Omar and any of our uh, guests today, you can use the chat function on the platform uh, to pose that question. And when it comes to the general Q&A at the end, we'll try and get as many of your questions through as possible. And of course, the same goes for you audience members here at the Biscuit Mom. We'll now hear from Dr. Fidelis Hove, uh, a team leader in the Project Management Office of the South African National Treasury's 9 billion Rand Jobs Fund, which was launched in 2011. It operates as a challenge fund um, to and uses public money to co-finance projects um, with public, private and non-governmental organizations through a competitive grant process. The question that we'll be asking today is how do we really support the SMME market um, and can technology play a role? Dr. Hove, lovely to have you here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak at this exciting festival. Uh, I'm not much of a creative either, Dr. Omar, so I quickly shuffled myself in order to position myself uh, so that you can see that lovely painting behind me. <laughs> so It works. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, right? <laughs> so I was going to talk a bit about the Jobs Fund, but I think we've heard uh, all the essentials. So I think in the introductions, you would have heard of the 9 billion rand that we were capitalized with in uh, 2011. Uh, but you must be asking yourself, what is a challenge fund? Um, so a challenge fund is a financing instrument that is used to allocate donor or public funds for specific purposes using uh, competition among applicants as a lead principle. So the most competitive applications are awarded funding after an open and transparent process. So it's really a mechanism that's about encouraging innovation, uh, co-funding, um, and aiming for social impact. And as far as I'm aware, the fund is still South Africa's only operational challenge fund that's actually funded by government. Uh, the fund works with intermediaries, and I'll explain that a bit later. We can move on to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm really zooming through these slides because I know you are excited and anticipating to hear the SMME story. So, but I think before we get into that, because there was a discussion previously about um, the involvement of government in this space, supporting SMMEs, creating employment. So I think it's important to, for me to flag a couple of points in terms of the impact uh, that the fund has actually had. So we've had significant success in terms of unearthing and nurturing several flagship job creation models. 
Uh, examples include our partnership with the CDI, but also Arambe Youth Employment Accelerator. I'm sure it's very familiar to most of the audience. And in terms of numbers, uh, nearly 12 billion of private sector funding has been crowded in from almost 6 billion that we've dispersed to date. So I think that's a significant point to make because here we're seeing the crowding in of private sector investment into efforts to solve one of the most important social challenges we face. So these resources have been used to create nearly 300,000 jobs. Um, and the picture in front of you shows the breakdown um, in terms of how many are permanent, how many are seasonal. The seasonal ones are in agriculture, which actually makes up a third of our portfolio. And uh, in that space, we've supported over 16,000 smallholder farmers. So to date, we've contracted about 146 projects, and 20 of these are in the informal economy where we've also had significant impact. In terms of the number of SMMEs supported, uh, the number might not be on your screen there, but the number is actually 39,000. <laughs> and 98% uh, of those are owned by previously disadvantaged individuals. So there's a lot of social inclusion uh, and, 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 and equity that we push. We can move on to the next slide, please. So while these numbers are pretty impressive, um, it's clearly not enough. I think for us, two factors are worth pointing out. Um, we've got about 3 million more young people who are likely to go into unemployment over the next three years. So there's that demographic factor. Um, even prior to the onset of COVID, the economy wasn't growing fast enough to absorb the increasing numbers of unemployed. And as Dr. Omar was alluding to, we've seen results from surveys by StatsSA and others showing the devastating impact the pandemic has had on employment and on micro businesses. Um, and this devastation has been particularly worse for businesses ran by women. And as um, the good doctor mentioned earlier, a lot of the structural reforms required to improve the economy are already underway. So that's encouraging. But really, with those two factors giving us uh, this kind of context that we've got, it's clear that to solve the unemployment challenge, we need to think differently about a number of things. Um, so we think that first, we need to think differently about the concept of a job. We need to move away from obsessing about formal jobs and move into the space of looking at earning opportunities. Because the conventional definition of a job, well, those jobs may never exist at the scale that we need. Um, and by the way, there's a wide range of earning opportunities emerging as society advances in terms of digital technology. Um, listening to the program for today, I'm quite certain that we're going to hear more about these opportunities in the sessions that follow. So we need to talk more about earning opportunities and obviously carefully look at how these can be supported so that they allow for a decent uh, living. The second point is that we need to raise the bar in terms of how we support individual entrepreneurs, micro businesses, and, 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 and SMMEs in general, because that's going to be the game changer in terms of ensuring a decent income for more working age members of our society. So that's the broader context, but I think it's important for us to ask the question, do policymakers, social impact investors, funders, banks, put the entrepreneur at the center of the design of interventions and products aimed at SMMEs? So we've learned a lot over the past 10 years as a fund. And our view is that there is insufficient focus on what the SMME actually needs and how to meet these needs in an impactful way. So some estimate that about 80% of micro enterprises are actually home-based. So if you think about a typical micro business in a township, you find that the uh, business is really inseparable from household activities and resourcing. Uh, this applies whether we're talking about a food kitchen located in the family yard, uh, a mother who weaves baskets, or Tabo the mechanic who's fixing cars just outside his yard, as you can see in the picture there. From our own interactions with these businesses, we've learned that there's often no distinction between the finances of the business and those of the household. And yet research shows that business owners who keep accounts uh, and business records that are separate 
from uh, the finances of the household are actually three or four times more likely to create employment than those who don't. So the conflation between personal and business finances is a critical factor. And by the way, this type of conflation also exposes the household to the bankruptcy of the business uh, if it goes belly up. So many entrepreneurs battle with that aspect, uh, which can be solved to some extent through specific training around financial management. But really, in order to address the challenge more sustainably, you need to first understand the enterprise in question and also have an appreciation of the household itself and its dynamics. Here, the role of the country's well-targeted social grants system has also been crucial because it provides a base level of income for poor households, which in many cases, it actually takes care of basic needs. Uh, so this we've seen sometimes gives fledgling businesses a bit more breathing space. Uh, so in the field, we've also seen several cases where entrepreneurs in retail need business systems to manage payments, sales, inventory, or maybe they want to diversify their product lines by offering digital products and services. In other cases, the need is for assistance in terms of business support services. So here I'm talking about bookkeeping, sales, marketing, you know, all these capabilities that formal businesses wouldn't battle with, but these become limiting factors for micro enterprises, uh, informal businesses in particular, as they then cannot access cheaper lines of credit from more traditional sources where they'll be asked to submit financial statements and all manner of formal documentation. So as shown on the chart, SMMEs need support with a wide range of other things, including basic infrastructure, working capital, et cetera. Um, so these are some of the areas where SMMEs say they need support. Uh, we can move on to the next slide because when you look at that SMME support ecosystem, a couple of things are quite obvious. So the ecosystem is made of you know, well-meaning parties, including uh, government, uh, corporates, lenders of various types, nonprofit organizations, et cetera. At the top of the chart on your screens is a split of annual planned expenditure within the SMME ecosystem. I need to flag that this is a framework we are developing together with uh, an advisor and research firm called Red Flank. Uh, and these numbers are pre-COVID, but I think they still get the point across. So pre-COVID, about 665 billion rand per annum was earmarked for different types of support interventions for SMMEs. And we think that's a low estimate, by the way. Uh, but the point is only 3% of this was government funding. So that's about uh, 17 billion. So as you think about those numbers, I think the first point I want to get across is that current government and private sector spend isn't targeted at what micro businesses need. So if you move to the middle of the chart, you can see that most of this spend is actually what is actually on what we would call traditional support, which is training, uh, and that's often once off training, uh, funding, which is extremely tough to qualify for, by the way, and sometimes infrastructure is provided, and this does make a difference. But the key point is the transformative enablement that SMMEs need to grow, uh, create jobs, and be sustainable is often neglected. So this type of transformative enablement is critical. And our projects and partnerships uh, through the intermediaries that we work with have shown us that, you know, without this kind of enablement, which really includes things like value chain integration, uh, access to enabling technology, enabling services such as sales and marketing, but also access to cheaper inputs, offtake agreements for products or digital marketplaces and the like. So this really facilitates that step change that we're looking for. So you need tailor-made comprehensive support from day one through to a point where the business is more bankable and then it can tap into more traditional pools of funding. So we often interact with informal economy entrepreneurs who've been supported by one of the big government departments or sometimes even by big corporate through their social impact program. And they will say, look, I really needed a fridge to store my inputs, training on how to keep my books, 
and the government and this corporate provided that. But now I need a backing to carry my products to my customers. And now there's no one to help with that. Banks say they can't assist me. Uh, the government department says it has already assisted me and now they need to help others. So I don't know where to turn to. So we've got a significant funding gap in terms of SMME support. But the second point I want to make is that most of the funding that is available isn't well targeted at micro enterprises, um, especially not targeted at informal economy entrepreneurs, yet they make up nearly three quarters of all SMMEs in the country. So that's where the opportunity lies in terms of unlocking new jobs and earning opportunities at scale. As uh, the good doctor mentioned earlier, traditional lenders aren't geared to give and administer microloans at an affordable rate. And with the kind of transformative support we're talking about, micro businesses often don't meet the documentary and security requirements of these lenders. As I've mentioned, banks require company registration, uh, le level of record keeping that many micro businesses struggle to satisfy. So we need innovation in this space. When you look at government funding, yes, it's more concessionary. But again, as you see on the chart there, only 2% of that 17 billion is targeted at SMMEs, um, especially those in the informal economy. So we've got issues there in terms of eligibility criteria. It's often too strict. Um, and we've seen this play out in terms of how uh, many of the COVID relief packages haven't reached the intended um, businesses. So as we you know, look to rebuild our economy post COVID, uh, we need to bring back SMMEs to the center of the design of interventions. We need to channel resources towards these needs and support their transformation into sustainable enterprises. COVID relief packages explicitly targeted at SMMEs, as I've mentioned before, have not had the intended impact, but it's important to note that social grants, on the one hand, boosted demand and uh, household consumption levels in the local economies where a lot of these micro businesses operate. So that's a huge positive. And they've also cushioned households where these businesses operate in a way that relieves them from, 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 from strain. So I think I mentioned this earlier. We need to build on that, right? and improve the support ecosystem so that we actually provide tailor-made comprehensive support that covers all six areas shown on the slide there. And we need not put our needs for formalization at the fore of how we respond. We need to put the needs of the SMME at the center. So I think on that note, I will end uh, my presentation and we can have a discussion, uh, Q&A and such. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hove. Uh, the, I suppose the reality that we also need to contend with is that a lot of the small and medium enterprises did not manage to benefit from any of the relief packages announced by the president, partly because they're not formalized. They do not have the paperwork and the uh, triple form um, filled out five times and submitted in 25 different offices in order for them to enjoy that. And I suppose the innovation needs to come from not only helping those in this sector, but also government realizing and banking institutions that you don't need 25 forms to actually register a business in South Africa. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the issue of formalization is quite topical, but it's also very complex. I think that uh, there are degrees of informality. So, yes, a home based micro business would be classified as informal. Uh, using most metrics, but as you move up the scale in terms of turnover and the number of people employed by a business, you find that even some small and medium-sized enterprises actually operate with some degree of informality. There's also the fact that you know formalization means different things to different businesses. So in the food sector, there's often merit in having safety standards because I mean we don't want poisoning. Um, and in some cases, you've got uh, vendors requiring certain permits in order to trade at specific spots. Uh, but even in that space, to your point, um, there's often a punitive relationship, actually, between the authorities and the businesses involved. So there's, a, there's actually room for us to change that dynamic and have a more incentive-based approach to getting some of those uh, regulations in place. Um, but 
to some government departments and some players in the industry who support SMEs, formalization is about getting a business registered with CIPC and paying tax, so registration with SARS. But we often forget that all enterprises, including those in the informal economy, already pay VAT on inputs that they use, that, you know, but they don't claim the VAT refunds that most formal businesses benefit from. And we've also seen research that shows that, uh, you know, these micro businesses largely fall below the tax threshold. So there are no gains really to be made in terms of us imposing some of these uh, 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 eligibility criteria because we wouldn't benefit from any tax revenue from it. So it's probably time we consider, you know, using CIPC, SARS registrations as preconditions for support. So we need to change that. Um, and there's a way in which we could actually, you know, incentivize entrepreneurs to opt into different forms of formalization for as long as they see a direct benefit. So we need to have the SMME at the center so that the lens is one that says what will benefit the SMME and then we allow them access to that. So the question really is whether formalization can assist in supporting and growing informal economy, employment, and earning opportunities. Um, and, 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 and I think, you know, back to my, the, the point I made earlier about keeping the micro entrepreneur, the micro business at the center of the debate. That's what we need to do. If formalization is required at different parts of their growth path, then we need to assess what type of formalization and allow that access to those resources. But it shouldn't be a a cookie cutter approach or one size fits all. Uh, so I think that's that's you know that's what we've learned in terms of that uh, conversation on formalization. Well, a lot of people um, are resonating with that statement here, Dr. Hove. Thank you very much, and we'll be exploring a little bit later that notion um, of you know the traditional view of what a job is. You walk into a building at eight o'clock, you check out at five o'clock, you have lunch yeah. and tea breaks in between. That is really the job of the past, is it not? As we see certainly younger South Africans participating in what is known as a gig economy, where for five hours of the day, that's what I'm going to do. For two hours tomorrow, I'm going to do something else. For three hours on a Friday, I'm going to do that. And collectively, hopefully, I make enough money to then obviously sustain my life. But we'll come back to that topic a little bit later. Now it's time for me to introduce you to the third speaker for the day. Uh, Jenny Cargill is the CEO of the Strategy Execution Advisors, which advises large organizations that operate in complicated environments um, to achieve the kind of impact that matters to people. And uh, you'll be answering the very uh, unenviable question, Jenny, of what role the public sector needs to play as an enabler. Because as both Dr. Omar and Dr. Hove have indicated, there is a role for business to play, I mean, for, for government to play in this space. It's, it's wonderful to be here, particularly to CDI and Erica to create a real event. Um, <laughs> it's completely liberating. <laughs> I've got no slippers on in this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful to be here and to participate in this. It's, it's really been two interesting introductory talks. In fact, all my points I want to make feed off those. I just have to say, Abba and I did not share our presentations. <laughs> he picks up on a lot of points that, that, that I'm going to make. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit off beam on the government side of where I think they should start rethinking some element of what they're doing and then look at a part that they are doing, which I think is, is very helpful at the moment. But I mean, I think, um, and Abba gave a very good summary of this, we are an economic shock. I mean, I think that is fundamentally where we are. And really the address, the, the question I think is most important is what can government do to ensure that, we're not, that we can have a recovery and that we're not going to go into ruin. And I think that's what we're all worrying about um, as, we, as we have to deal with um, the future. So I wanted to first because look at economic resilience because that's, that's a question that Erica raised with me to say we want you to address resilience and how the government makes you more resilient. So I thought, let, let me give you my understanding and the reading I've done and the bit we've picked up on this of what constitutes economic resilience, so we're all on the same page. And, and fundamentally, resilience really is the capacity of an economy to resist a shock and to kick back and recover um, really well, either to the same levels of growth or better. So that's what we're looking at when we look at economic resilience. 
I also looked at some of the research, the recent research to say that's taking place that is looking at economic resilience under the COVID environment, because obviously the whole world is sitting in a particular shock. And where are we finding, what are the pointers to resilience that come out of looking at a pandemic like this? This is clearly early research, because we, you know, we feel we've been a long time in COVID, but from a research perspective, very short. Sorry, can you hear? And then, and I just picked out a few issues that I thought were quite interesting for us to look at when we deal with um, COVID and economic resilience. So what makes us more resilient when we look at something like a pandemic and we've got hit by a pandemic? The interesting thing is that countries or regions that have more experienced workers, have a higher share of experienced workers over young workers are more resilient. And that, that's, there's a logic to that, obviously, because basically they bring um, an ability to quickly assess complicated environments, manage them, deal with them. That's a factor for us to consider in South Africa with our high numbers of youth, who are many of them not experienced and don't even have the requisite education. Then the other issue was this area around that some have measured self-employment, or SMMEs, and we've been discussing this as a proxy to entrepreneurship and innovation. <laughs> And again, where you've got greater self-employment and, 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 and SMMEs operating and they're much stronger, you've got greater economic resilience. So that's another really interesting factor. And this has come up with, with um, ABBA, which was greater economic complexity and diversity makes you more resilient. And also this issue of greater penetration of digital technologies. So those were ones, and I will touch on some of those and come back to them. Okay. Um, but I wanted us to look at another aspect of resilience, which doesn't get really touched on very much. And there's a wonderful book by Jarrett Diamond. It's the most recent one that came out just before COVID, in fact, so it was really a really pertinent time, looking at upheaval and how nations cope with crisis and change. And there he focused on behavioral attributes and, and asked himself, you know, when we look at individuals coping with crises, we look at a lot of behavioral at attributes that allow them to cope. So what about countries? Are there not behavioral attributes to countries um, that allow themselves to cope better with a crisis and change? And this really resonated for me because in, in research I was doing around looking at very achieving bold reforms, and I looked at Vietnam. And um, what was particularly interesting by why I looked at Vietnam was it got out of poverty faster than any country has done in most recent economic history. So in, in, in the matter of just 20 years, they moved from 60% of their population in the 1880s being in poverty to, in fact, having only 15% of their, their country being in poverty. And when I visited and was interviewing and meeting a lot of people and talking to them about this achievement, um, when I went there, everybody had a kind of storyboard about themselves, you know. Always, they, they would repeat the same people, different people would repeat the same words all the time. They had the storyboard. And they would speak about being pragmatic, flexible, forward-looking, um, ability to manage um, instability, um, being very focused. And they really prided themselves on the fact that they never took compensation from the Americans. So they had a strong sense of independence. So these, the, that was really, I found interesting, because I thought these are behavioral att attributes for success. They're not the normal stuff we see policy addressing and taking on board. And so if you look at what, what someone like Jared Diamond was looking at, he looked at coping with crises across individuals and across to your um, countries. And you can read those, but some of them are very interesting. You've got to be open and honest about what you're facing. You've got to have core values. You need to be able to, as countries, look and take responsibility for solving your problems. And these are really relevant issues for us as South Africans, I think. And, and so I think this component gets forgotten about when we look at solving our problems. And I think it's a very critical area. But now if we look specifically to South Africa and where we are, I mean, basically, I mean, I think we've had a reverberation of shocks from, from the global financial crisis in 2008 and thereabouts, onto you know, a decade of, of state capture, onto a pandemic, and then now most recently, as the president referred to it, an attempted insurrection. So we, we've really been bashed about. We've been in the ring. And I think there's, the consequences have been very severe. Um, we've had um, ABBA give you a full list of what's taking place there. I think it's important to know that in this 
Um, and additionally, we have a state where it's not capable, a large parts of it are not capable. Um, we've also got a very delivery crisis of really effectively implementing what, what we need to be working with. Um, we've spoken about power shortages and the digital problem. So I think we've been all of that, and I think Abba raised the thing positives. I'm going to leave you to start thinking about some of the positives that are there. One of the positives that he touched on is a completely different dialogue with government that's taking place between um, civil society, business, and, um, and government. You know, government, business, for example, was not at the table on discussions before. Business is very clearly at the table with government trying to discuss problems. And I think this is a major shift that, that has taken place and is a positive, so that different viewpoints and ideas and solutions are starting to come through in a way that there was not before. There was a shut door um, before under, under, under Zuma. So let me take a little bit of a different tack here. And, and everybody has emphasized small business and everybody's emphasized micro business. So when I look at resilience and economic resilience, you're looking at growth, you're looking at a vibrant economy, you're looking able to take the knocks. So I'm not offering solutions, I'm offering an idea of what I think we should be thinking about um, and really looking at. And so we, look at it, we need to look in different places and we need to look differently about future courses of action. Um, I think at the moment we're still battering around in the same paradigm that we've got. We're still looking at the same stuff and the same, the same boundaries. I think we should knock back some of those boundaries. This idea I presented in the 90s and wrote about, um, it, with the ideological positions then, it went down like a lead balloon, <laughs> and never, never to be seen again. And then when I wrote my book uh, in 2010 and published it, I've got an element of it in it. Um, and I, I still think it's, a, it's, it's something we should be tackling and worth looking at and getting on with. And it has been raised by the previous speakers. I think that we forget about the M and SMEs completely. We're actually talking about very small businesses and micro businesses, which is what I, the, uh, Dr. Hove was talking about. And we forget about the growing the middle class. And there's a very good reasons I will give as to why. I think that we want to put at the center of our economic policy resolving that missing middle and addressing the middle. And it doesn't sound popular, I know, but <laughs> I think it really does offer us some opportunity if we start looking at things. So if we look at policy, let's look at it through the lens of the requirements of your middle class and your middle-sized firms. Because I think policy at the moment, most of it is set at dealing with, um, if you look at policy, it's dealing with large corporates. So a lot of our economic policies are designed to suit them. And, and, then, and then I think we should start saying, let's look at all policies through that lens of what's good for middle and not. And, and I'll come back to why I think it's really important. But that's really where I think we should be putting our policy focus on what government could do. And I know we say don't revisit policy, but I do think we need to revisit some of the policy on the issues we're talking about here and has also been raised on the small businesses. If we get the missing middle and we start growing, you start immediately dealing with inequality. It starts as an automatic addressing of that, that problem. You will start finding, and I'll come back to why that is. The other issue is you can't address your missing middle unless you get quality education. It's just not possible to go that route and take that. And we spend more money than many countries on education. We have one of the highest um, proportions of budget and GDP that goes to education. We must have one of the lowest returns in the world on our education. So basically, we've got a big problem there if we want to get ambitious and we want to really grow this economy. And then the middle really does help us address innovation, as does better education, um, and getting that really going, because you, you, get your, you get your innovation mainly coming from people in the middle classes, middle-sized firms, etc. You don't, the rags to riches story are really rare. We love them, they make wonderful reading, but they're not where most of our top growing countries um, draw their sort of vibrancy from as economies. So I think that I wanted just to present that and then give you a view on why does the middle matter? And basically, when I say the middle, you're looking at mature small, small businesses to medium-sized firms. The sizes will differ per country. 
So Germany's middle-sized businesses will be our large-sized businesses very often. But if you, look at, if you look at countries like the very strong European countries, they have got very strong middle-sized businesses. They're large, they're big, they've got, they're really well structured. So the, the research has shown that if you look at these businesses, you get much higher productivity if from a medium-sized business than you do from a startup. And some amazing research has been done by Professor Scott um, Shane, and you've got a quote there which says, you know, to get more economic growth by having more startups, this assumes that you would need these startups would be more productive than other firms, and they're not. So startups and small businesses are really important because they provide your pipeline to move up into middle. But we've got a barrier that says no one moves up to the middle or very few make it. So you've got, that's, that pipeline must feed that middle. Your, your real generator of growth is in that middle area. And we've just blocked it. It's very difficult to move up. And so people get captured in the lower area. The lower area and the micro businesses, all of them are very important for self-employment and that sort of issue, but, but they're not the critical drivers of really growth and resilience. So this is where you want to have a look at it. So I contend that our policy lens is far too focused and centered around large corporations, and that SMMEs are an economic policy sidebar, and they just get dealt with on special programs, and I think Dr. Hove gave a really good um, coverage of that. And I think it's time that we need to say, if we're th rethinking economic policy, let's put this start thinking in this way and go center stage. Um, so I also say we need a good, strong girth. That's what we want. We want the girth of a goggle. We want to really, <laughs> and we've, we, we really need to go that route. So I think it's what we want. And we know, uh, basically, let's look, on this slide, I just look at the actual middle class rather than the enterprise and the firm. And this is shrinking, and Abba's given us some insight into this. But actually, under COVID, although the poor got the most hit, we don't realize that the middle class got really badly hit in COVID as well. And the figures are dramatic. There's a 17% drop in individuals earning between 22,000 and 40,000 rand a month. And there's a 23% drop of those who earn over. That means immediately you're creating a fiscal crisis. You're just feeding into that ongoing fiscal crisis. We've, I've got slightly higher figures than ABBA on the 4.3. The re, it's statistical. Lots of people are still registering with SARS when they shouldn't be. I think ABBA's figure are those when they strip out those, because there's many hopeful people thinking they're going to get a refund <laughs> from SARS, and they're not. <laughs> so they register all the time in that hope. Um, but basically, we've had, over, over since 2012, a 32% decline um, in our taxpayers against 11% population increase oh. in numbers. So we are sitting with a, a real crisis there. So our middle class really need to be addressed. We've got a rapid growth in the black middle class. And basically in 2014, and the reason I'm taking this, is many definitions of middle class. I'm just taking a figure that was done with the World Bank, National Treasury work, and Stats SA. They had their own definitions. There's many definitions, so some people will come up with different figures. But I took this because it, is, it said 80% are black Africans, 70% black um, South Africans, and about 40% of the black middle class works in the civil service. And I think this is a big issue. Without any aspersions on civil servants, the civil bureaucrats do not normally feed the entrepreneurial side of the economy. And so we've got our black South Africans for the middle class largely locked into the bureaucratic environment and their access into the entrepreneurial environment isn't really adequately represented or facilitated and dealt with. And I think this is another area government could really seriously look at. And it comes back to, to, to getting that entrepreneurial energy going. So from that perspective, I just wanted to, to, to go on to the network industries very quickly. This is, the, this is the more traditional, it's an absolutely f critical requirement for um, economic resilience, is that your base infrastructures work because we can't get anything done. And as a government, government is paying a lot of attention to this. So this is a big focus area that's already been mentioned. Basically, there's four areas that have been prioritized. It's your energy, your water, your transport, your digital communication. But the how is quite interesting. So government is starting to change how it is trying to regenerate this and get this going. 
And, and what they're really starting to do, which is very hard for governments to do, is prioritize. They're starting to say, we're not taking every energy problem, we're not taking every water problem or digital problem. We're choosing a few things that we believe are very catalytic. And if we solve those, we can get onto the next stuff and the next stuff. So, and that is very hard for governments to do. They just struggle with this. Um, and so they've started to do that. And the president has given full oversight over this. So this gets run and watched over from the presidency. And this center of government role is a very important one because this is a complex area with many cross-cutting issues. How do you get all these parties to engage and talk to each other and get the right leadership and the decision makers in the room? And they're not just government, they are business. They are civil society, they are unions. So basically you've got everybody and you've got this capability that can be managed from the center of government. And the unit that they're using is this Operation Vulundlela, effectively a delivery unit. And that unit is there with, shared with Treasury because they've got Treasury um, appointees and they've got presidential appointees from the presidency. And they're really a, a, a small, tiny group of professionals who are focusing on getting the delivery in few prioritized areas. And so we're working with them on one, for example, on just getting some regulatory environment standardized across the country for the rapid deployment of, of um, a broadband, for example. Because if you don't get that done, you know, you've, you've lost the, the digital um, race with people. So we, we're working with them, but I do think the other lens, I've spoken about that medium, that medium missing middle lens for policy, I do think all our policies have to be underpinned by climate change. I think we've got beyond not having to address it. And I don't think we should be having debates on it. I think at every time that's the other lens we need to look at all of these um, big bold reforms that we're trying to make there, and government is now really playing in that field with other partners, which is uh, very important. So here's my concluding comments. So basically what I'm saying is I think the middle we should see as the catalyst to really generate growth, to really create economic resilience. And here we look at the, the enterprise and the entrepreneur. If we look at network industries, they're our foundation. We can't do without them. So we have to, the economy needs them. And then I look at behavior as the glue. Now I haven't addressed behavior in any detail here, but behavior means we need to start looking at the leadership, the culture, the creativity we have, innovation, open-mindedness, honesty, brutal frankness about ourselves. Those are the issues we want to bring up. And so those, I think, is, is a way of kind of thinking about how we could rethink how we look forward, what roles government can play, and although I'm focused, my expertise is focused on delivery and implementation, I do think there's core areas of policy we need to come back to around the SME arena. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. That, that was really, really insightful. And I suppose <laughs> the, the immediate question then becomes, how do, we, how do we achieve that and still look to address, what, 12 million people who are unemployed in South Africa, if we accept the broad definition? So I think if, we, if we're looking at the SMEs and we put the middle-sized firm as the center, I think it affects all our policies on small business. They're the pipeline. So it, it'll mean that the small business doesn't become, or the micro-business doesn't become the sidebar. It means that they start to become the core of our policy. And then, you know, I do believe we've still got to create jobs, formal jobs for people. I do believe, and I think that the, the, the best rate of job creation is with your medium-sized businesses. So what are we doing to grow them and support them? So we've got so many people unemployed, so many youth unemployed. Many of those youth will never be entrepreneurs. Um, we need to get some jobs going. So I do think that, that um, when I say put the middle size at the core, you've got to then make mainstream your small and your micro and look at them differently because that's your pipeline to that middle as well. I don't think there is a quick fix. I honestly don't think there is a quick fix for creating jobs. I think we've just got to be very bold about making some hard economic decisions and going for it. And I think getting started. We say don't wait for the perfect policy. Don't wait for, have I got all my ducks in the row? Don't have a hundred meetings, for goodness sake, before you do something. Um, let's just get going. And, and, get and going are, you, are you seeing evidence of that, where people are starting to think in that way? 
or is it still falling like a lead balloon uh, to the people it needs to, so to listen to? There's some very good people we're seeing in government who are really trying to do that. They're saying just get on with a few things that Operation Wood and Leila is doing that. There's others you can pick up. But there's a huge culture shift in government that needs to take place that kind of frees up what you need to do. Um, what you're seeing in part in the president, that's right? That's right. But, yeah. but there's a whole yeah. bureaucracy yes. underneath him that then needs to shift and that is like you know, turning a Titanic, basically. Yeah. And that's where leadership must come in. They mustn't sit on the sidelines and think we don't get involved. They have, to, they have to change as well, and they have to say, let's stop having the peripheral conversations. Let's stop being internally focused. Let's stop worrying about our structures. Let's get everybody focused on what's the purpose. What do we want to achieve? Yeah. And yeah. that's a leadership role and getting strategic clarity on that. And that, I think, we've still got a bit of a road. The president's got it, I think, but I think we've got a bit of a road to go. Jenny, thank you very <laughs> much indeed. Our fourth and uh, final guest for this morning is Songoba Vuba, uh, who is the co-founder and managing director of SMME implementation consultancy Perpetuate. She served as the COO of 10X uh, Entrepreneur Accelerator, as well as a commissioner on the South African Presidential Commission on Fourth Industrial Revolution. And Songoba, you don't have any uh, formal presentation to, to share with us today, but uh, you're happy to engage yeah. on a, a couple of questions. Uh, first off then, uh, your, your immediate response to uh, the presentations by Jakob, uh, by um, Jenny, obviously, and Fidelis um, in a space that impacts on you. Yeah, I think it's actually fantastic going after the speakers we've, you know, I've, I've, that have gone ahead. And like Jenny was saying, it's also awesome because you can just build on it, right? I think, I think it's awesome to take a sobering look at the numbers. It's, it's, um, it's painful, it's depressing, but it's needed um, to really get a really um, solid look at what the numbers look like, but also then to quickly shift gears on the practicality of what can be done. And I think, um, it, and it needs to be rooted in the awareness of the policies we sit with, the awareness of the positives and the negatives, and the awareness of the fact that we're coming out of a pandemic that has stripped years worth of progress in many sectors, in the middle class, within small business as well. And I think, and that's why the focus is on implementation for me, which is when we talk about what have been the impacts and how do we get this economy to grow, yes, there is a need for entrepreneurship, yes, there is a need for innovation, but there is also a need for people to be in employment and actually be able to have some sort of revenue come in. And the question becomes, how do we achieve more and more of that? And I think it's awesome seeing even the numbers coming out of the jobs fund and you know talking about 300,000 jobs created. But that's over a long period of time. And the numbers that we're chasing of millions and millions of people that need jobs challenges us to how do we 10 times that number? How do we go from 300,000 to three, to 3 million? people who are actually in job opportunities and in job growth. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about we need to make that shift around how do we define jobs. And it's not an either or. I think we need to make peace with the fact that we're no longer in a world where it's big business and big business alone and all of us are going to be employed by big business. And it's also not a small business alone and all of us are going to be employed by small business. It really is around finding that balance and finding the balance in the levers where Big business is playing its part. Small business is playing its part. You've got people employed as full-time employees. You've got people who are in the gig economy, which continues to grow, and are able to find opportunities locally, but also internationally, and be able to create employment. It's about even challenging our labor unions, I would say, around redefining what work looks like and what work means, and really starting to unpack what is the role of labor unions, which is to protect workers. Now, if that worker is a gig economy worker, what does job and work protection look like for that worker? And how does it see its way through policy, through the work of labor unions, through the work of government? How does large business get more comfortable with working with gig workers? You know, and bring them in in order to grow their outputs for you know, managing their overheads because we know that they're not creating massive long-term um, you know, permanent jobs either. Now, at the risk of being, I suppose, the Grinch that stole Christmas, um, <laughs> we sit in a particular situation in a country where we've asked and highlighted the issue of quality of education, right, and the output there. Jenny, a moment ago, noting that 
we continue to invest the most, uh, certainly on the African continent, and one would argue around the world, and yet the return we're getting is certainly substandard uh, to what we need to get. We, we are a nation that punches above its weight uh, geopolitically. Uh, we're part of the G20. Uh, we get invited to the G7 meetings. Um, certainly, you know, the leadership of this country is, is, is being heard and participating in important spaces. Um, Fourth Industrial Revolution is here. It's not something that's coming. It's here. And in many ways, COVID-19 pandemic accelerated aspects of that uh, to, uh, to the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And yet South Africa is so way behind. In terms of policy, we're still fighting over spectrum 10 years afterwards, you know, and doing all those kind of things. So, so how do we multiply the 300,000 jobs that are created by the Job Fund into 3 million? and multiply that by four to actually address the 12 million shortage and still exist in a fourth industrial revolution while we're having challenges that we're having in basic education. I think the reality is that if we're in this fourth industrial revolution, leveraging second industrial revolution solutions is not going to help us get there. I think that one of the fundamental mindset shifts, and when we talk about behavior and like mindset, is that to live and experience the fourth industrial revolution means that you need to be comfortable with a decentralized yet networked approach. Right? What that means is previously you could have government make the decision or in a large corporation a CEO makes a decision and it trickles down and everything sorted. And unfortunately that's no longer the reality. Yes, government has work to do, but like you said, it's turning a titanic. Yes, there's stuff to be done in education and there's some awesome advancements, but they are taking time. And as a citizen, I can either decide to sit back and wait for government to get it right or sit back for large business to get it spectrum and for them to stop fighting in court, or I can get on with it, right, in the areas in which I'm in. I've seen from like in informal environments where young people have got up and got going and got themselves certain skills that actually allow them to unlock job opportunities in order to be able to have some sort of income. You know, we've, we're seeing a lot of um, small businesses that are intentionally going after unemployed youth and upskilling them into roles that they can actually earn an income and be able to grow that business. You're seeing a lot of small businesses making digital pivots, which is how do we better the product or service that we're offering to be more competitive, not just in South Africa, but actually on the continent, and then actually enable us to grow at a rate that is much more exponential than what we would have if we employed second industrial revolution approaches. And I think that's got to keep happening, and I actually think snowball effect, and oftentimes I, I'm of the opinion that policy makers don't make the trends. Policy makers will not change this country. Oftentimes policy makers will catch up with what people have already started to do and already started to knock on the doors of what is in our policy. You see that even a really good example is just platform businesses um, like you know, a sweep south which is literally hiring millions of you know, um, women, men, to do domestic work. And a lot of the policy in this country actually stifles platform businesses in this country. But they are able to create employment nonetheless and then kind of go back to government and say, listen, we currently represent one and a half million people who are employed on this platform and here are the policy changes that we need made. And I think that while not excusing the slow you know, pace of change, but rather actually spurring it on with real case studies of we've done this, this has worked, this has not worked, here's what actually needs to happen in policy. We've seen this work in small business, we've seen this work in micro businesses. We've seen this grow and shrink our middle class and therefore this is what needs to play out in policy. I think that that's the shift we need to make. That it's not kind of some experiment in a black room trying to think of what will work versus not, but that we're actually seeing real case studies of what does work and starting to see that trickle upwards, not downwards, but trickle upwards into influencing what our policies speak to. Well, two things that immediately come up, because whenever you speak of industrialization, you think of losses of jobs, because you turn into technology to replace human capital in order for, I don't know, a product to be taken down the production line, right? That's the one thing. Secondly, um, and it's not the case with South, but many other 
platform-based industries that have been imported to South Africa. Um, many of the people who have taken up those employment opportunities through that platform have often called in certainly to my radio station and said, I'm being exploited. So how do we protect the South African who is desperate for an employment opportunity from being exploited by some superstar person sitting overseas? No, correctly. Correct. And I mean, that's exactly what I mean about some of the challenges that we're finding in what's playing out in the country already has not even begun to feature in our policies. When we talk about kind of so a social security net, we're not talking about the person that's on that platform that's built and owned by someone outside of this country. And we have not even begun to think about and lobby government for what that protection looks like. We have more and more young people in getting involved in the gig economy, most of them doing work for companies outside of South Africa. You know, and we have not really started to lobby policy around what does that social protection look like. We keep pushing a lot of people into entrepreneurship and it's going to be the holy grail and it's going to be amazing. But what does like actual social security net look like for entrepreneurs? Because a lot of entrepreneurs have ruined their credit scorecard ratings, gone into incredible amounts of debts, and when they fail once, they don't have the liberty of failing more than once, actually have their lives destroyed and have to start all over again. And I, and I think that those are conversations we need to be having that unfortunately aren't happening. And unfortunately, people are looking for opportunities beyond these borders. And we're not going to say, well, listen, in this fourth industrial revolution, just stay in South Africa, because that's exactly how we found ourselves here, lagging behind. Um, and I, I, I just think that we need to be cognizant of the things that are already happening, cognizant of the trends that are happening, but also cognizant of the specific skills that are required. So that what type of skills do we really need in government? What type of skills do we need in government to get stuff done? What type of skills do we now need in our labor unions? What type of skills do we need to be teaching children in education like you speak about? And this notion of education being a stop start, starting you know, 18 months old and you're finished when you hit grade 12, is a complete misnomer because there are literally continuous learning and education required because of how quickly things are changing. And we have not really begun at scale to respond to that and actually work to that. And we need to start seeing things, the many things we're doing in job funds, the many things we're doing in funding of small businesses actually respond to those realities. There's an even bigger conversation around, as you say, when do you stop learning? Because I argue that in the near future, we will stop having matriculants going into university or college studying for three years. They will go, I need to be able to reproduce that for the next while. I'll take a short course, do that, continue doing it until I need to do the same. And then you end up actually being a lifelong learner who keeps on Correct. going back whenever you need, Correct. you need something. All right. Uh, I mean, I could go on for hours. Uh, if you have any questions, please indicate by a show of hand, and then we'll bring a microphone to you, and you can ask any questions of not only Jenny and uh, Songoba, but also Fidelis as well as Jakub. Um, and obviously, if you are on the platform, uh, you please use the chat function in order for us to uh, get those questions uh, to you. Uh, but let me go back to you, uh, Fidelis. Uh, you, you, were, you were quite adamant that we really need to look at what is a job. Jenny quite rightly says there will still be a place and a need for a formal job, uh, however you define that. But as you say, in, in, in continuing to support the work of SMMEs, we're really going to have to look at those job opportunities, how I suppose the, 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 the disadvantage for me to a job opportunity that is then short-lived is that you become a teaching assistant for six months, you earn whatever the income uh, government is going to make available to you, and then for the rest of the year and for 2022, 23, 24, you're sitting at home unemployed. I think I understood what you're asking. So uh, w when we start to look at the space of uh, earning opportunities, I think one thing that we need to figure out and solve for is how we allow for that transition between one earning opportunity to the next. So if your earning opportunity isn't a trade related, so it's not that maybe you're an artisan, uh, but you might be an unemployed young person. We've seen a uh, government coming in with a very uh, potentially impactful initiative, the, the, the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative, which is really asking the question that 
if 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 we have all these youngsters who are unemployed and most of them have been in long term unemployment, they need a series of earning opportunities to build their capabilities, to build their confidence. That will then create a profile that allows them to leap onto uh, that more stable uh, job. So what this initiative is actually doing is creating a platform, so back to the points about how technology can come in, a platform that will allow every unemployed young person to register for this program. Um, it's free for them in terms of access. Um, once they're on the platform, there will be an ecosystem manager who actually then looks at the needs of the unemployed person uh, and the needs of the market in terms of what opportunities arise in terms of earning um, and then do the matching. But then after that first opportunity, that platform will also facilitate transitions between the first one and the next until that profile is built enough and sufficiently for that young person to eventually transition into a more uh, stable opportunity. So, so there's a lot that we can do in terms of uh, using technology uh, and using networks to actually facilitate that transition from one earning opportunity to the next. Uh, Jakub, let me bring you in here then. Imagine you are a future employer and you've got a job spec that's out in an advert and people are submitting those CVs. And as um, Dr. Hove has just uh, highlighted, you've got a candidate, Africa Milane, who did six months there, three months there, two weeks there, and no long enough stint, if you like, in one job where, and many of these job um, adverts, by the way, require five-year minimum experience in uh, a formal environment. How are we shifting that um, paradigm that a future employer will now appreciate that we live in a gig economy where people will take up job opportunities whence they come, and hopefully, collectively, they will then afford them the experience that they need? Um, <clears throat> I can speak from three perspectives. <laughs> One is from my personal perspective. <laughs> and uh, whenever my kids look at my CV, they say, Dad, you've been behaving like a millennial all your life. <laughs> I mean, I've been in different <laughs> positions and different jobs and different trainings. And different... So I, I think that's the one thing. And then, obviously, from my own children's perspective, um, you know, both of them are in the... What, one is, Gen, well, one is Gen Z, the other one is millennial. And, um, and I remember last year, my daughter, who had just finished her honors, uh, was coming to me and said, Dad, how does one get a job? You know? <laughs> <I> thought, okay. <laughs> and, um, you, know, I thought, you know, you look at adverts, you know, but really, you know, it, it's a really big question that you're touching on. And I think Nong also touched on this whole thing of education and training and getting the jobs and that kind of thing. And also Dr. Hope now. So uh, I think that's the thing. And then thirdly, as, you know, as a research institute, uh, I must say the uh, Mapungubwe Institute is probably unique in a lot of ways, uh, given the kind of almost uh, very good youth profile we have. Um, and, uh, and we keep that very thing in mind, that most young people would have had internships and bits and pieces here and there and so forth. So, um, so we actually need people to you know, get uh, the gray hairs like myself to start really looking uh, potential candidates and not to hold it against them that they haven't been uh, in one place for long. And that it, it, it doesn't work that way anymore. And given the nature of our economy, it's not going to be that way for long while because at best young people are going to have short term experience. Within. What I would like to add to the conversation is and it's the kind of thing that um, I kind of raise at my dinner table and I kind of think mm, maybe at one point I'll be brave enough to raise it publicly as so I'm doing it here, you know. It, it, it shouldn't we just, just stop hoping that we'll get education right and just try and move those budget figures into enterprise development. Um, you know, we're spending billions, we're raising expectations, hopes. The education system is so, to mind my French, effed up. And, you know, parents hope, oh, they get a metric certificate and they come out and they're going to get a job and they're ill-equipped to do anything. And COVID has messed up. Even up. 
So I keep wondering, like, is there a way that we can have a significant shift in the budget so that that kind of entrepreneurial spirit of people being able to do something, you know, um, and, you know, I mean, the EPWPs and the, as you're saying, the teacher assistant jobs and things are fine, but you know, you've got to help people set up on some trajectory that's not soul destroying as well, you know, that I'm just going to be stuck, you know, cleaning this part of the street or the city and that kind of thing. Um, and and I, I hesitate raising that because, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact that my daughters have graduated and the postgrad studies and things like that. You know, I feel like this privileged old man that's not saying, oh, well, you know, education is not for everybody. Education is for everybody, but I think that, you know, uh, in a sense, it's a kind of revision of the German system where you get equipped with certain kind of core skills uh, at, at formal education, but the real skills training happens at the job, you know. And we keep thinking that matriculants are the ones that are going to go in and work and create value and uh, have prosperity, etc. Look around you. Look at look at which of the younger people have actually begun earning, and they've actually broken out of that mold. And there's, you know, like, uh, you know, got a uh, like I was uh, a fifth of six children. I was only one. The, the first one to go to university, all the others started working. I think that my sister, elder sister, went to college after that, etc. But we had to start earning quite quickly. One or two went into some business or the other, and that kind of thing. But we really need to radically rethink this thing. That given the crisis we have, huge unemployment, poverty, hunger, you know, what can we do to just shift it around? I'll leave you with that, Africa. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And I'll pass the baton over to Jenny. <laughs> on, education. <laughs> on, on education and how, and how you can shift it. You'll need your microphone, please. So, I mean, I, I sympathize with Abba's frustration. We've worked in education. We've done quite a lot. And it's a really tough area, particularly also culturally. If you're not a teacher, you're not an educationalist, you're not, as they say, what do you know? And, and put you aside, and there you go. But I don't think we can give up on kids. I mean, I think, I don't, I just, I think it's, we can't. I mean, I think that's the f bottom line for me. I do think the way we work and the approach we take is, is there a catalyst by which we could prioritize that would really make a difference? for young people. So I can give you my bugbear, which I've, uh, you've given me an opening to talk about, <laughs> and that is reading for meaning. Yeah. You can't do anything if you can't read, with a, a comp do comprehensive reading. You can't do your maths, you can't do your design work, you can't do a lot of your innovation. You're basically stuck. So you could say, let's just focus on one thread. That's a catalytic thread, that, by putting a lot of resources into that. It's a wonderful way also of mobilizing society, bringing in volunteers, getting people in, getting them into schools, helping young people, but get reading. And I think for me, that's, I can, I can understand I was saying all the other stuff, just leave, but let's do one thing right. It was actually the independent schools, uh, one of the associations that did a study that showed that as much as we were focusing a lot on the STEM subjects, science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and mathematics, it was the focus on language that unleashed the potential to perform better in those STEM languages yes. pretty much yeah. be because yeah. of that. But let me bring you back to, to the presentation that you made earlier, where you said that there, there, there appears to be a barrier in South Africa in realizing the M, right? Yeah. Um, what, what are those things and, and how can we take a chisel and just like, you know, get rid of them? Yeah, so I think we've got to, that's where I say let's look at policy. Um, I do think we've got to look at what are all the major economic policies that might be putting that barrier in. And I think one's got to build the evidence and you've got to look at it. So automatically people will say labor policies. Um, I don't know. What elements of labor policy might be really um, um, hard for, for medium-sized businesses to do? You'd need to have a look at that. Um, um, black economic empowerment. What elements of that are difficult? What elements are not bringing in value? What elements could bring in huge value? You know, and start saying, let's, let's unpack difficult policy questions. That's why I don't think anybody goes there, because some of the questions are really difficult. Competition policy. 
you know, I mean, we've got we've got a most onerous competition policy now. You know, it's it's banks and nobody can share information. So now they're getting exemptions under COVID, so they can share base information in order to achieve something. And when Do you we, know what the greatest thing is? <laughs> is that I can go to any ATM and draw without having to pay additional charges. No, <laughs> Best thing ever. Only until the 30th of September. Okay. <laughs> is COVID gone by then? I don't, I, I don't know what made them decide that was the date. <laughs> but you you can see you were where you need collaboration on certain things and on particularly on innovation, you can't do it in South Africa. They, they're terrified of talking to each other in case they get taken, um, they get taken to, to competition commission on that. So I do think what we've got to do is sit down without huge amounts of, but get the data, get the real story, get look what is blocking. What is the financing? What are the financing mechanisms? You know, we've got very few specialist financial organizations that can fund this. Very small amount of money goes into this part of the area if we, if we compare it to the kind of investments in the big corporates. So I'm not suggesting we want years of research. I'm just suggesting we've got a lot already, but that probably the biggest hurdle, Africa, is to actually face the difficult political questions and policy yeah. questions. Because if we're brave enough to do that, then we will tackle some of these issues no, um, and get there. So Indeed. So, Mwaba, the young people surely are at the greatest advantage, are they not, when it comes to not only fourth industrial revolution, um, perhaps to have the, the courage that Jenny is talking about to ask the very unpleasant and very difficult questions because they're not weighed down by, a lot of us are invested. I mean, we've, we've spent all our lives sort of going in a particular direction. If you're going to tell us this doesn't work anymore, we're going to feel slightly offended and assaulted, right? Where somebody young is going to go, well, that hasn't worked. Let me try, let me try something new. Th those are opportunities that young people will be able to exploit, surely. Yeah, I think, I think like you say, there's, there's behavioral and characteristic traits of young people that set them at a potential advantage. Um, but I think that is definitely balanced out and weighed out by the systemic context in which they find themselves. So yes, I may be like, let's try and fail forward and let's get on to the next thing. But if, if we can't release Spectrum, you know, the, the, and I'm paying like hundreds of, um, for data, that is a limitation. So yes, what you're seeing a lot of is like young people are getting quite creative in kind of getting across the barriers and by doing that sort of thinking and innovation, you're seeing new standards being set, but it definitely is against the grain. So yes, the characteristics make sense, but it still requires an enabling systemic system, which talks about what you know, Jenny's mentioning about kind of the the middle breaking through and what's stopping that. When I speak to entrepreneurs about what's stopping their growth, it's, it, it makes more sense to register my business outside of South Africa, first of all. Okay, so a, a number of high scale businesses do, are not domiciled in South Africa because legally and compliance wise, it is more of a burden for their growth than it is to be registered elsewhere. A number of IP producing companies and individuals register their IP outside of South Africa because they have better IP protection outside of South Africa and they have better capabilities of scaling their IP across geographies if, it, if they are not domiciled in South Africa. Another one is, and I think it was mentioned by the prof earlier about the ease of getting the type of labor that you require in your business to get a scarce skills visa for an individual who is outside of the country to come in and work here in that small business to help it scale is damn near impossible and you need massive resources in order to make that happen so it literally is we have businesses that could scale much more than they are and either they need to make the choice of being less patriotic to do it in other words leave and do it uh, you know have it registered elsewhere or they need to grapple with slower growth than they could actually achieve. And these are the type of things that we need to start seeing coming through in our policy. I know that there's work currently advocating for a Small Business Act, which says, listen, this act, the acts we have are great for large business, but they are not practical and not enabling for small business and medium-sized businesses to scale and grow. And these are some of the things that's preventing people from kind of you know, moving through the ranks in order to hit the medium that actually can grow our you know, pay YE base, that can grow our innovation and entrepreneurship, all these things that we say we want to see in order to see the economy grow. 
Thank you very much indeed. So Ngoba Vuba, the uh, co-founder and managing director of SME Implementation Consultancy, Perpetuate. Thank you to Jenny Cargill, uh, who is the CEO of Strategy Execution Advisors. Thank you to Dr. Fidil, Fidilis uh, Hove, uh, who is a team leader in the project management office of the South African National Treasuries Job Fund. And of course, thank you to Dr. Yakub Omar, who is uh, with the uh, Mapungube Institute for Strategic Reflections. I think all of you have given us some food Food for thought uh, this um, this morning. I'm going to ask that you ladies are excused so that I can bring back uh, Sebastian Messerschmidt, uh, who is the Consul General um, in the Consulate of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Cape Town, and Erica Alk, who is the Group CEO of the Craft and Design Institute, for their reflections on day one of In the Couch, where we were focusing obviously on the economy in South Africa, and particularly the creation of jobs, given the fact that, as Dr. Omar said, we have 12 million people who are unemployed. Um, Erica, I have no doubt you were given much, 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 much to think about and to reflect on there. Um, yes, sure. Um, my mind is, um, is full and buzzing. Um, I think the, the, my sort of biggest takeaway, what I was thinking while, while um, people were speaking, is it kind of almost feels like we've got two worlds that, that, that are colliding, and, and kind of old world, which is um, centralized, regu highly regulated, um, and controlled from the, from the top down, which, if I think about it, is, is what that kind of apartheid system was in South Africa. It was a highly regulated, controlled environment where we were told where we could live and, and what we could do or what we couldn't do and with whom. Um, and a new world, which actually is freer, um, decentralized, um, networked, um, and yeah, I mean, I guess free, I guess, I mean, I'm seeing people nodding, nodding in the audience. And it's like, how do we, we're stuck in this, in this old world. Um, I think also Fidelis sort of spoke about moving from, um, I mean, I think the issue of sort of how do we understand what jobs are or what income opportunities are in this new environment. And how do we, instead of functioning punitively, function in an incentivized way. So our assumption is not that people are bad or will do the wrong thing, but our assumption is that people are good and will do the right thing. Um, and how do we create the environment for that, for that to happen? Um, so that's my, the kind of what's going on in, on in my head. And then it's almost like how does, how does government or policy or the public sector actually catch up with that and enable that? Um, and, and how do we, I mean, I think this is, you know, creatives, I'm coming from a position of being a creative, is that this is how we function in this way. So how do we help yeah. um, move, things, yeah. move things along and break the, the, yeah, the rigidity of, of the past? Sebastian, what are your uh, takeaways from the last two hours? Sure. Uh, <laughs> my problem is always that, that my hyperactive mind wants to go in all these little details and also have, the, have also the broader, the broader framework. Because when I hear Song Oba speaking, for example, about the problems that you have getting your, your, your people from outside the country into the country and just the visa problem, that's something that the Dutch businesses who are active in South Africa also encounter and they try to employ as many South Africans as they can, uh, triple B, double E, uh, compliant, and, and still they face all these problems in administration and getting the right skills sometimes you have to get from outside this country. This is one element, and we, we can go on and on and on about it. Uh, and and I, will not, I will not repeat everything that was uh, said because there's, there's too many things, and I thank you for that framework you just laid down there. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that either. But there's one thing that struck me. There's one thing that struck me that I think will have to come out out of these four days that we're doing today, and today was a really good start with that, but also out of your resolve that you're going to take with the city of Cape Town, and also what I heard from the creative exchanges, is how do you get the, 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 the civil society and the people to talk to businesses, to talk to government? How do you structure that in this society? Because we cannot do it the way we used to do it. Uh, we have to find ways of improving that. Now, 
we were talking about in the beginning, what can you get from outside South Africa, maybe bring it in as solutions. And I was telling you, please don't do it that way because you can't just copy paste. But you, but you can look at other examples. And in the Netherlands, we, we have, for example, a very structured dialogue between these three, which also has a very big influence on cabinet formation, on, on economic plans yearly, on, on all these things. So there's, we found a structure which works in our model, which we call the Polder model, because we like to talk, 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 and we, we gave it a Polder model name. And that worked for us. And maybe we can, we can see how you do it here, because also we need to change and innovate with the fourth industrial revolution being here, um, jobs becoming earning opportunities, that rethinking paradigm, great speak there. I, I really think that we need that kind of paradigm shift to get us ready for today, not even tomorrow. Um, so yeah, we, we have to think these structures. And then, of course, it comes down to how do we open these channels? Because these four days are great. Uh, your resolve will be great. But how do we find a structure in where we keep the dialogue open between civil society, the people, between the businesses, the smaller, the medium size, and the bigger ones, and government? Because government needs to hear. Government needs to be open to hearing, hungry to hearing, to find those policies that will enable and incentivize people to create jobs. Um, th this has been an amazing start. Good, fantastic. What happens next, Erica? Um, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, we, we, we're going on a, on a site visit yeah. to an amazing entrepreneur in Kailicha. Um, so people in the room and people online can join. Um, and this afternoon we have one of our first ideation sessions and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm seeing nodding in the room. So. So uh, logistics yeah. around that, obviously people in the room, it's easy, they just get on a bus at half past 12 and we take them to Culture Cycles. Uh, those who are joining us uh, via stream, how do they make sure that they get to be part of the experience? Um, click on the link. <laughs> <laughs> can we drop the link somewhere on the chat function so that people can click on it? And then the idea, um, um, the idea is... Ideation? That's so, the um, Same thing. So um, we're going to have a physical session here with, with people in the room and an online facilitated session. Um, we have a, a fabulous Dutch designer facilitating the online session. If anyone online is listening and you haven't registered for that event, I suggest you do because it's going to be a very good opportunity to work um, some of the ideas that might have been sparked by this morning's session. No, for sure. What are you looking forward to in that session? Because I know that's what excites you. That's it, it's about having the conversations that we've had for the last two hours, which were unbelievably fruitful, unbelievably mind-blowing in many ways, because you know, there are a couple of questions I've noted for myself that I'd not even thought about in this space. But ultimately, what we want from this festival is that even if it's just one, there's one idea that we take, we work with over an eight-month process and implement and see realizing the kind of objectives that you want to, to realize. You just answered yourself the question you asked. True, me. I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to you doing that. <laughs> we can switch chairs. <laughs> no, but you're right. That's exactly what it's about. <laughs> it's, it's, about but it's nothing to add. There's nothing to add. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much to you both. Of course, we will be on this journey all week, so I will see you tomorrow. And um, for a teaser, of what you'll be able to experience uh, at Culture Cycles. Here's a short video of the incredible work that they do. The culture of cycling has, has grown, and I think the more we provide access to bicycles for people to actually commute, uh, that's where we'll see the culture really growing in, in Kailicha, and that goes for the economy as well. My name is Cindy Lemavundla. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Culture Cycles. Uh, Heroes on Bikes uh, was a wild idea um, and it was a response really to the COVID-19 pandemic where we provide bicycles for essential workers. Uh, we do this together with uh, Avalanche and Pedal Power. Uh, we've been fortunate to get the bicycles from uh, Ben, uh, donated by the Department of Transport together with the Bicycle Consortium. Today we're here at the Bicycle Empowerment Network to pick up our donation of bicycles that are going to Heroes on Bikes in Kailicha. <laughs> we 
We are at uh, Makaza Ken in Kailicha. Uh, we are delivering uh, five bicycles as part of our Heroes on Bikes donation. Uh, Makaza Ken is one of um, a chain of Cape Town together and they've been very instrumental in assisting the community to get ready uh, during the COVID-19 time. And we're excited to be uh, donating uh, bicycles to them to further their work. They run quite a number of initiatives, which include a soup kitchen uh, that feeds quite a huge number of people around Makaza. Uh, so the rain is starting to pour down. We are at uh, our second stop at uh, Harare Ken, and we are doing a bicycle handover. Juma is just uh, showing um, the beneficiaries how to uh, mount their handlebars. Guys, the social distancing. Wow, thank you for this awesome initiative. This is awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much. There's a spare cube. Uh, please ensure when you're riding a bike you have a helmet on. No helmet, no ride. It even says on the bike, right? Um, the dream, obviously, is to have a bicycle shop, the first bicycle shop in Kailicha, um, and to increase or to grow uh, the culture of cycling uh, within, uh, you know, uh, townships. So, um, this is where the Culture Cycles uh, bike shop is going to be. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, to work uh, with the church and the private owner who owns the land. And uh, the bike shop is going to be built uh, using shipping containers. And uh, we're very excited and I think the locals are also excited. Uh, there's going to be quite a lot of uh, development uh, business opportunities that are coming out of here as well. So for people who would like to donate a bike for an essential worker or support any of our causes that we're doing, they can go on uh, Becca Buddy. Uh, www.beckerbuddy slash culture cycles uh, that's where they'll find all our fundraising efforts And of course, you'll get a chance to meet to Cindy Lair and the team from Culture Bicycles uh, in a, uh, a few hours, I suppose. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the uh, day one version of On the Couch. We'll be back here again at 10 o'clock. Uh, there's still a full day of activity, engagement, exchanging of ideas that you can enjoy. Thank you very much. Hashtag Co-Create Design Festival 2021.